Welcome to the Health Equity Lecture Series and happy National Hispanic Heritage Month. I'm Rear Admiral Sharday Arojo, the Associate Commissioner for Minority Health and Director of FDA's Office of Minority Health and Health Equity. This year's theme for National Hispanic Heritage Month is Unidos, Inclusivity for a Stronger Nation. And while we celebrate the rich history and many contributions of Latinos during this observance, our focus today is on Latino participation and clinical trials. Latinos represent about 18.5% of the U.S. population. And based on the FDA drug trial snapshots, five-year summary and analysis of clinical trial participation and demographics from 2015 through 2019, of the U.S. data, 15% of participants were Hispanic or Latino. And we need enrollment in clinical trials to reflect the populations most likely to use the product if that product is approved. To discuss the state of Latinos in clinical trials, Today, we are pleased to welcome Dr. Fabian Sandoval, President and CEO of the Emerson Clinical Research Institute. Dr. Sandoval has more than 25 years of bench to bedside research experience. His diversified research career has been in academia, healthcare systems, and the public sector. He received his Bachelor of Science in Molecular and Cellular Biology from Marymount University and his Doctor of Medicine from Autonomous University of Guadalajara School of Medicine. Before opening the doors to Emerson Clinical Research Institute, or ECRI, Dr. Sandoval's research activities included bench research at the National Institutes of Neurological Disorders and Stroke, where he focused his work on early onset Alzheimer's disease and Creutzfeldt Jacob syndrome. Dr. Sandoval also served as the Supervisory Research Integrity and Compliance Officer in the Army Human Research Protections Office and the Office of the Army Surgeon General. His input has been instrumental in the review, development, and selection of protocols, in addition to education and training for resident and hospital faculty. Dr. Sandoval, it is with great pleasure that I welcome you to today's lecture series. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Rear Admiral. It's a pleasure and an honor to have this discussion with you this morning. So to get started, why don't we begin with you telling us a little bit about the beginning of your career? What inspired you to become a clinical researcher? So what inspired me to become a researcher really uh, was several things. I started to work at NIH when I was a little kid. I was, I think, 15 years old and uh, learning to wash dishes at, in the lab, learning to see what these tubes were called and why we were doing what we were doing, and then watching the scientists start their process and going into the clinical center and talking to patients there and bringing back samples and processing them in the lab got my bug about what science was and what clinical research really was. And then as I grew within my career, I realized that regular medicine wasn't for me because in clinical trials, I saw a little bit of everything and I was always learning. And that inspired me to start doing what I do and love. So tell us a little bit more about Emerson Clinical Research Institute and the Emerson Diversity Health Foundation. Sure. So Emerson Clinical Research Institute, um, I started eight years ago, and my mission was and has always been trying to help those patients that have, have or had not before any access to clinical research, didn't understand the value of clinical research, the importance as to how it could impact them or their families immediately or in the long run. So that's why we started to do this. Patients didn't understand this and, and it was my mission, it's always been to do that. And then within our foundation, our foundation focuses on education and outreach to patients. And that is where we start the discussion of science, the discussion of the value of clinical trials and why we should be a part of it. So before we get into our discussion on clinical trials, I wanna talk a little bit about the health of Latinos in the United States. What do you think are the main challenges facing the community today? You know, that's a great question. Um, I think there's several issues with uh, Latino health and access to care. The first one is, is knowing where to go, knowing that there's someone that can help them. Then there's the issue of a language barrier. When you're sick and you're in another country, uh, and if you don't understand the language, 
it makes it very difficult. It's hard enough to communicate to ourselves in English. Imagine now someone that has that challenge to try and speak to someone about their condition. It's very challenging. So instead what they do is they talk to their neighbors. You know, what would you do in this situation? Then they go to the Hispanic markets and buy whatever medications they have and behind the counter that they have brought from other countries and try to take that. Then there's the issue of finance. How expensive is it to go see a doctor in the US, especially if you don't have insurance? If, and then for those that have insurance, where would they go? So it's all of these levels that makes it very complex for us to sometimes reach out and provide adequate care to patients. So Dr. Sandoval, as a clinical researcher, um, I wanna talk a little bit more now about um, your thoughts related to Hispanic and Latino participation in clinical trials. Why do you think it's important for us to have Hispanics, Latinos, and other diverse populations participate in clinical trials? We are growing. We are a growing community. We have these beautiful interracial marriages. Our genetics keep evolving. And when we have this mix, we need to make sure that medications work within our community. So how can we continue to advance diverse participation in clinical trials, especially among Hispanic and Latinos? It's a simple and a hard question to answer. The simplest answer is by educating patients, by telling them the benefits of those who can participate, and there is a little bit of risk, and we have to be honest with that, but tell them the value of conducting clinical trials within their communities, why we should do that. Um, and then the second part is establishing a true level of trust, one where patients can talk to any of us in, with an open, candid discussion as to why we're doing what we're doing. I think once we educate the patients and we have established the trust um, is when we will marry these two to really have an increase in diverse population that want to participate in clinical trials. You know, and when we think about the need for diverse participation, we, have, of course, have to take into consideration existing barriers to participation. What are some of the main barriers to participation in clinical trials that, that you think the Latino and Hispanic communities mm -hmm. face? You know, there's always a, the rumors, the chisme, as the Hispanics would say, right, is, is debunking those myths of you shouldn't participate. You know, this is going to happen. So, so all of those erroneous thoughts, we need to help uh, dismiss. And that's done through education. Uh, then the next part is once we've actually talked to patients that want to participate is actually getting them to the door, getting them to the clinic. And sometimes it's something as simple as being able to offer transportation our patients don't have access to transport personal transportation all the time. So when we say, we're going to send you a car that's gonna bring you here and take you back home or take you to work or have a service that's going to not just bring you, but your children as well, that allows patients the flexibility to come. And then part of flexibility is not just having a nine to five operation. It's being able to come in on Saturdays or on Sundays, doing home visits as well because now we're showing the patients that we really do care about them, that we're going way beyond standard of care because our mission is to serve them, give them the best care and give them the best option and hope to a new therapeutic area. Yeah, and a lot of what you just mentioned highlights the importance of community engagement. And I know that is a critical component to the work that you do. And it's really important in helping to raise awareness about the need for diverse participation and for diverse groups to participate in clinical trials. So what are your recommendations to other researchers to engage with patients and the communities that they serve? Be in your community. Go out and find your community. Let them see you. Be Not just be behind your desk or behind your exam table or behind a phone. Meet with them face-to-face -face where they are. Set up small um, tables where you can educate and, and not necessarily talk about a particular study, but talk to them about the benefits overall of their health and continue to do that. Once you've gone out into the community, then you can do higher level activities within social media, radio, TV, commercials, things like that. But people have to recognize you, recognize the name of your institution, recognize your face and say, that is someone who's been, I've heard a lot about, and it's someone I can probably trust. 
So as a researcher, what are some of the barriers that you and other researchers experience when you're trying to enroll a diverse population in clinical trials? So uh, if, you're, if we're talking about the healthcare professional, one of the barriers that we have seen is increasing the time allowed for those professionals to conduct clinical research activities. There's only so many hours within the day for us to do any activities. And if you're seeing patients on a day-to-day -day basis and it's a full schedule, you don't have time for clinical trial patients. So we need to have our leadership, our bosses say, you know what, we're going to give you an hour a day or an hour a week to see those research patients. That's the first one. The second challenge is for, for those providers to even receive a clinical trial from any of the sponsors that are conducting clinical research because the, it's a catch-22. They may want to do the studies, but they don't have the experience in conducting a clinical trial, but they see the patients every day, and then they won't be awarded that study because of that same reason. So we need to um, give proper mentorship, give proper guidance to those investigators, those doctors. They're not investigators yet. They're just the doctors in the community that want to conduct trials because they're, if they want to, we need to help them do it. And as a researcher and physician, are there any lessons learned, best practices and recommendations that you can share uh, based off your experience to not only increase diverse participation in clinical trials, but ways that we can continue to advance diversity among researchers? You know, I think it has to do with language. Uh, it's being able to, to communicate in the same language and if not have materials that are available in those same languages as your patients, having the informed consent and the, the target audience that you're trying to reach, having the marketing in those same languages. I think that is the, the best way to get started on these barriers and then working through those because if we're able to talk to our patients and engage them and talk to them, not talk at our patients, we all want to feel respected as an individual, as a patient, and feel that it is a true level of care and compassion that these doctors are talking to us about these studies. So if we have that genuine ability to do so, those are probably the, the biggest barriers that we are confronted with that we have to overcome. And it's very easily done with those things. If, if we get the time to do it, if we're able to talk to our patients, and if we develop that, that synergy between science and care, and that our patients really see the value for them or their relatives. So Dr. Sandoval, I know you always have a number of projects ongoing at one time. Can you uh, share some information with us about any of the current projects that you're leading that are focused on engaging Hispanic and Latino communities or diverse communities overall? Yes, you're right. There's always, I, I always have some iron in the fire trying to do something to help out. Uh, we have grown our outreach within our foundation when it comes to the consulates. We used to support Mexico, Guatemala, and El Salvador, but now um, we've also been able to include Peru, Honduras, and Colombia into that mix uh, to give some access to information, access to care opportunities, free screenings. We're now being able to do more screenings. Uh, my next project is actually, I'm trying to get uh, my hands on a, on a mobile unit so that we can go within these mobile units into the communities. Once again, um, ma'am, trying to go to our patients because sometimes they can't come to us. If we get this mobile unit up and running, we can go to those patients. And the last part is within our TV show, uh, we air in uh, DC and Virginia and Maryland and Connecticut. But now I've been blessed with the fact that starting in October of this year, we're also going to be airing in Chicago. And why Chicago is so important it is the number three market in the country when it comes to Hispanic viewership. Um, there's a, a very large Hispanic community there that we want to educate, educate on everything that we do from care, access to care, knowledge of a disease, and then potential opportunities for uh, hope within a clinical trial setting. Thank you again so much for the work that you do to address disparities and advance health equity. And thank you for the extremely informative, informative conversation today. Uh, before we end today's webinar, I do want to encourage our viewers to visit our website at www.fda.gov forward slash health equity to learn more about our clinical trial diversity and enhanced equity initiatives. Dr. Sandoval, thank you again. We appreciate you joining us today for this important conversation.